Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to SED's uh, special talk. My name is Jean Green. I'm the chair and founder of Sussex Ellis Danlos Group and absolutely delighted today to have um, Bonnie Southgate, who I'm going to read is our resident sports therapist, rehab and Pilates specialist and um, has her own studio and does a lot of work, which she's going to explain about and has studied. But I also know something else about her, so I'm going to embarrass her slightly, that, um, <laughs> that she was um, a, a prima ballerina with an American Royal Ballet with Mikhail Baryshnikov, who was one of my um, I, sort of in awe of, and probably you as well, if I'd known you and also with the Royal Ballet um, and, and then diversified and is doing really well. So I'm going to hand over to Bonnie now to do her presentation on slipping ribs. And then in a sort of series, we'll do um, hips and pelvis later on and hopefully some questions, I'm sure they're building up already. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Jane. It's really kind of you to invite me to talk. Um, yes, I mean, embarrassing. Yeah, so I did dance. I originally danced with um, American Ballet Theatre and then I married and came over to the UK and then danced with the, the Royal Ballet for a very short period of time. Um, and then sort of career ended earlier than probably I would have liked, um, mainly because of my HEDS. So I've got the diagnosis like everybody else and was in considerable pain. Um, which kind of led me down the rehabilitation route because I thought it would be um, in my mind back then useful for dancers. Um, and I, I, at that time, I didn't know that I had EDS. So once, once I found out that became more of my, my passion was working with EDS people. Um, so yeah, I trained first as a Pilates teacher and Actually, I got more um, subluxations doing Pilates originally than um, I had before. And I kind of wanted to find out more about the human body and try and work out my own body, why that was happening. Um, and I think I was, people were excited because I was a dancer. So they used to load me quite heavily and it was too heavy. So my joints would slip out because they assumed that I'd be really strong. Um, so that led me down the path of studying as, as a sports therapist, also with the intention of working with dancers, <laughs> um, which is why I didn't do physiotherapy. Instead, I chose the sports therapy, um, but it's, it's great. And I'm always learning. I've also learned um, uh, cranial sacral therapy and lots of other techniques that I thought would sort of join and, and fit well with what I do and with our, our sort of, um, particular condition. So what I'm gonna to do today, um, originally it said slipping ribs and pain in pelvis and shoulders. Um, and I realized very quickly that that was just too much of a subject to cover. So what we're gonna do is split it into three parts, if Jane's happy with that. And we're gonna start with a little presentation on slipping ribs today, and then we'll do the pelvis followed by the shoulder. They do all intertwine and interact. Um, um, but we'd be here all night, so. Okay, Bonnie, do you want to do full screen for yourself and we'll turn yeah. off all screens if that's you? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. And what I'm gonna do is share um, the presentation. So um, it's gonna pretty much go to that initially. And then I will, once I finish that, it shouldn't be too long. We'll come back and I'll answer questions for everyone. So I'm gonna share the screen now. Um, and here we go. So the subject that I'm going to talk about today is slipping ribs. Um, and I think it's interesting because I think we have different things going on with our ribs and slipping ribs is actually quite a specific um, thing. Um, and we can talk about the difference in, in subluxation of ribs and slipping ribs. So um, I just thought I'd give a really brief overview of the ribs. So we have three types of ribs um, and the ones in the pink are called the true ribs. And those are your rib one through seven. 
and they attach to your sternum bone in the front and your spine in the back. Um, the, the ribs in the back have quite shallow joints, which is where we become a little bit, um, I want to say it becomes easier for us to sublux in back, but that's not actually slipping ribs. So we have in green what we call the false ribs, and those are your ribs eight through 10. And the, the reason that they're called false ribs, we'll look at an image um, soon, is when they come to the front of the body and attach to the sternum, they don't attach directly into the sternal bone, they attach into the cartilage of the seventh rib. So they're not really truly attached in the front. And then the little blue ribs at the bottom are called your floating ribs. Um, and they're very near where your kidney sits. And so um, you've got fascia and, and tissue that the, the kidneys kind of sit and they sit there and they just really protect um, the kidneys in back. So there's something called slipping rib syndrome which is a syndrome that stems from irritation of what we call the intercostal nerve. So the spaces in between your ribs is your intercostal spaces, and you've got nerves there that, that innervate um, different things. And so those false ribs, you can look in the front and you can see where um, rib eight through 10 don't actually join to the sternal bone. Those are what we call slipping ribs, and they can actually, um, detach from the rib above and then they become sort of free floating and then they they can actually end up tucking themselves under um, the other ribs or they can actually pinch nerves and be really quite painful and um, obviously people with EDS are more likely to have rib sub subluxations so one of the reasons is we are a little bit less stable in the spine. So there's more play in all of the joints and all of the attachment sites. Um, we've got the decreased proprioception through the rib cage, which means that our movements might not be as coordinated as other people's movements. Um, and we tend to sometimes not have such good breathing patterns. Um, Due to stress and other things like that. And then we have a higher prevalence of scoliosis, which can put us at disadvantages of sort of torsions through the rib cage, which then can make us more likely to have subluxations and slipping rib syndrome. So slipping rib syndrome finding suggests that often the right side of the body is more involved than the left. I don't know why that is. That's just um, out there in the data. Um, and that bilateral symptoms are infrequent. So we tend to have one side or the other with our subluxations and dislocations. Although what I would say that's in the data is that when you have EDS, you, do, you tend to, to not necessarily uh, belong to the data and we can be the exception to the rule. So if you find you do have slipping ribs on both sides, then um, that is definitely possible. So one of the good things is slipping ribs will not cause you internal damage or puncture your lungs because I think sometimes people can worry about those things. So although they can be incredibly painful, you're not going to damage your ribs um, unless maybe you were in a car accident or something like that. The pain typically radiates from the chest, back and abdomen, um, and it can be made worse by sneezing or intra-abdominal pressure. So pain is caused by excessive movement of the lower ribs. And symptoms can inc include a popping or a clicking noise or sensation. Um, and often you'll get the pain in, um, it is typical in certain movements or activities. And those usually involve twisting or bending forward, or it can be extremely painful and deep breathing. Um, so sometimes they can be, it can come on after exercise, or you can feel the pain during the exercise or during breathing exercises, or even when you cough or you sneeze. Um, pain can be intermittent. It can be sharp, sharp when the, the rib tip is actually moving and then um, impinging on the nerve. Um, or it can just be there like a bit of a dull ache. So after activity that triggers movement, um, you can feel it more, more um, acutely. So resting and avoiding certain activities or even stretching out the ribs can help to alleviate pain sometimes. 
So um, there are similar symptoms to slipping rib, which are things like bronchitis, when you've got a chest infection and actually gallbladder issues can refer in the same way. Um, and because of this, often you'll go to your GP with the pain and they won't recognize it as a slipping rib syndrome. And we all know this is common. We go to the GP and we have all these musculoskeletal issues that refer pain, which they don't normally see or isn't that prevalent in the normal population. Um, and we get missed. So um, very unfortunately, with ongoing chronic um, slipping rib syndrome, which is not seen so much in the general population because they tend to have it um, more like specifically with athletes or injuries. Um, it can get diagnosed as psychosocial problems, um, the age old it's in your head maybe. And um, you know, then it can lead to depression and chronic pain because it's not being dealt with properly. So the recommendations and the ways that we can deal with um, slipping rib syndrome, conservative treatment, which is what I always um, would go for and advocate for first, um, in studies, they have found that osteopathic man manipulative treatment um, was the most effective but that the most commonly used was physiotherapy. So actually getting some, some manual therapy included um, in what you do has been shown to be more beneficial than probably just exercise-based interventions. Um, there's other therapies, so they, there are rib belts. Um, I don't personally think from personal experience, the rib belts are all that great in EDSers. Um, Chiropractic manipulation can be a bit too drastic, so it doesn't seem to have as good an outcome as the osteopathic treatments. Heat, massage, um, and then your painkillers, your, your regular painkillers can bring relief. Um, but again, it's not been shown to be as effective as the osteopathic and physiotherapy type of treatments. So, the other thing when you go and see the medics that they might offer you is um, an injection, either a steroid injection or like a numbing med medication. And what they're looking for is to see whether or not the actual pain is caused by the slipping rib. So they'll try and inject to affect the nerve that it might be impinging on. Um, and it's done um, really to, to see whether your symptoms are coming from that. So usually those injections will only last for two to three weeks and they tend to use that just to make sure it's not anything visceral causing problems. Um, you can also find trigger pointing can help a bit. So that would be a bit like the stretching around the ribs. Uh, they do use botulism in the musculature around it sometimes. Um, but again, these things have not been particularly great in long-term pain relief. So most of the time they offer surgical intervention if it's chronic. So they would be using, say, the steroid or the injections, the nerve block injections to see if they were sure it was a slipping rib. And then they may offer surgical interve interventions. Um, so... Open reduction of internal fixation is one of the things they offer. Um, sometimes you can get fractures or fragments with these, not so much in our situation, I would say. Um, so they will fix internally the ribs with plates. Um, and then the other one that they do is the excision of abnormal area of site injury. So um, what they will do is actually cut away the tips so that they can't compress the nerves. Um, but, so you can see an image there where someone's had that done and it can be multiple levels. Um, they do find that there are side effects from doing this and you can get problems because what you're doing is taking the protection away from the organs a little bit. There is new procedure on the market, I couldn't find much literature on it, but I have um, listened to a talk by a surgeon in America where they're actually tying the ribs with, with cables so that they can't move um, 
which is another option. So I think um, for me, in terms of my practice as a sports therapist uh, and my patients, patients or my clients that come into the clinic, one of the things that helps more than anything is teaching them how the ribs move. Um, and also making sure that the, the upper ribs move, because sometimes what happens um, with EDS is we end up a little bit tight and fixated around the ribs up top. And often that's because we maybe don't have such good shoulder stability. So we end up holding around the shoulders, around the scapula and like under our armpits, we become very tight in the upper ribs. And then we end up moving more in the lower ribs and then we become more at risk of the slipping rib syndrome. So um, we will talk about shoulders um, and we will talk about pelvis because it's all, um, it all interacts with one another. And I think sometimes stability of the shoulders is almost where you go first so that you can get the movement in the rib cage. Um, and then you can almost prevent the over movement of the lower ribs. Um, so, Again, thinking about the, the movement in the spine and the movement in the sternum, I, um, what I often also see a lot is that people think that movement only comes from the spine around the ribs and they don't think about the sternal bone in the front. And so they end up again, fixating in the front where they don't think about moving. So like the people that are actually watching this now, if you put your hand on your sternums, and you think about rotating your body, if you think about rotating your sternum in the direction you're going, it feels really different to just thinking about rotating your spine and back. So there are lots of muscles in the front and as well as the back of the body and, and the ribs really attach to both. So when we think about rotating and we're, we're thoughtfully think about rotating, we do need to think about that rotation from the front as well as the back. And that can help. So another condition that we often um, get or people complain of is something called costochondritis. And that's where you get inflammation of the cartilage in the front where it matches or meets into the, the sternal bone again. And again, that will be sometimes because we forget to actually move those bones. We're very good at moving some bits and not moving others at all. So you can, um, if you do have slipping rib, rib syndrome, you can think about moving from the front of your body rather than just the back. Um, and we're just gonna look, and I'm gonna talk on the next section a little bit also about how the bones move. So um, our ribs should always be following our spinal bones in their movement. So when we move forward, um, we're what we call flexing the, the spine, the ribs should follow the spine. So they should close in the front and they should open in the back. And that should be all of them, not just some of them. So again, we might find that we flex more from our lower ribs than our upper ribs. And that's going to affect um, the pull that we have on the musculature on the ribs. And that can also contribute to it. I think rotation is where most problems for um, hypermobiles come with the ribs because we'll end up tight on one side of our body and not so tight on the other. So we become more prone to those subluxations on one side than the other. So that's where we start to look at the rest of the body again, the shoulders and the pelvis. So just for your own knowledge in terms of how the ribs move, because I, when I work with my clients, I always like to educate them on how their bones move. Because if you have an idea you can at least think, well, are, am I doing that? Do they do that? So when we rotate, if we were rotating to our right, our rib cage on the right side would close down in back and open in front. So as we rotate, it moves a bit like that. So I don't know if you can see my hands here. We might do this after we close the presentation. And then on the opposite side, it does the opposite. So if I rotate to the right, they close in the front and they close in the back on the back on the right, front on the left. And so they're opening on one side of the body and closing on the other. So I think sometimes um, with a lack of proprioception and a lack of um, muscle strength, they don't necessarily move in the direction that they should do and they, they can be um, left behind. 
So what's also really interesting, and I don't think many people think about or realize, and I've got the image of this um, skeleton here, and these are the muscles in your back that help you extend your back. So those are um, three sets of back extensors, and they start um, through what we call the fascia, attaching to your sacral bone at the bottom, and then your pelvic bone, and they come all the way up and they have individual attachments to every rib. So your pelvis can really affect your ribs and your ribs can really affect your pelvis. And I know there was already um, a question on the torsion of the pelvis and the ribs. So it, what you have to kind of identify is the problem with the pelvis or is the problem with the ribs. And then you can kind of sort it out and help both. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in the question and answers. So it's the whole body is connected. Um, and if you think about, if you look at this image on the right, if you look, if you thought further down the chain, if you went down that leg into the foot, if I rolled my right foot in, it would roll my right leg in, it would take my pelvis forward and it might pull on my ribs. So really, um, not necessarily treating the side of pain, but thinking about looking at the whole body and how you work is the best way to improve any of these issues um, and definitely slipping ribs. So thank you for listening. That's all we're doing for the presentation because I didn't want to bog everybody down with that. Um, I think it will be really nice to have a chat with the people who are here and just find out what your issues are. And then we can discuss that and have a bit of a question and answer. It's the first time that I have been on um, the SEDS group. So it will be really nice to, to actually interact with you a little bit, I think, and find out what all of you want to know so that in future presentations or talks, I can make sure that we really cover all of those things. So I'm gonna have a quick look in the chat um, and we'll, we'll answer the, some questions now. So Charlotte, um, we talked about the, the ribs popping out and how to stop the pelvis from twisting. So it's never an easy answer with these things because what you need is a really good assessment and somebody who can assess you from head to toe um, and find out Usually there will be one area of your body where you have more of a problem and that when you start to help that bit, a lot of things improve. So with hypermobility and with EDS people, a lot of times for me, I tend to go to the legs and I tend to go to the knees because we hyperextend our knees. And when we hi hyperextend our knees, it really changes the mechanics of the foot and it changes the mechanics of the hip. And when you change those mechanics then as you saw those muscles go up and they actually affect the ribs so my first port of call with almost everybody is to try and um, teach them and and strengthen them in terms of the knees because once once those get sorted a lot of things sort of fall into a place and then you see what's left um, and the other thing with the ribs is the shoulders. So the ribs, the ribs themselves are kind of at the mercy of a lot of the other things that go on. So they're really there to protect your organs um, and, they, and they kind of get taken by the spine and the sternum. So often the individual, the problem isn't individually with the ribs themselves, but you'll find that it's, it's things elsewhere that kind of stop you rotating nicely and evenly on both sides. So hopefully that, that helps you a little bit. What I would say as well, what I am offering to the SEDS group is um, I'm, I'm not local to Sussex, but I'm very happy to do Zoom sessions with all of you. And I'm very happy to do individual um, Zoom assessments online. I've, I've dedicated my Thursdays to doing free sessions for people for, with um, SEDS um, and who are kind of in desperate need. So it'll sort of be um, first come, first serve, but anybody who does want an assessment, I'm happy to do that because I think sometimes what we need is the, the kind of full assessment. Um, so we'll go to next question, um, Jane. Um, pelvic girdle related. So um, 
sublux to hip 15 months ago quite badly and the whole leg went dead for a couple of days, um, but eventually regained feeling and since then have been having constant problems, inflammation and acute pain with the hip causing uh, a buildup of the limp and sending shooting pain down the leg every time she walks. Um, makes the whole leg go to sleep. Have had an X-ray and MRI done, and it says everything looks fine aside from the spine stuff. So I'm guessing nothing structurally has gone wrong in my hip, but the pain, inflammation, whatever. So my guess would be, um, sea swimming helped, but now that is nearing winter, I can do anymore. So um, Jane, if you're here, is this actually you? <laughs> I don't know if Jane's still with us because I know she's had to go somewhere this, today. Yeah. Hi, Bonnie, it's me. It's Kelly. That was that was my question. Oh, okay. Because I've seen Jane, but I haven't seen you, Kelly. So <laughs> if it was Jane, I might have something I could easily say. Um, is it very unstable, that hip? It, it is quite unstable. Okay. So... With unstable hips, I tend to, um, hips are quite funny because often you go to see somebody for an unstable hip and they give you an exercise for that hip. Um, but what I have seen in my practice is sometimes um, it's not that leg that's the weak one. And sometimes the pelvis can rotate off the hip. So when I do strength exercises, I tend to do both legs together because then I know I'm getting both of them. Um, and I'll tend to do things like using clinny bands, pushing the knees out with things like pelvic tilts to just get um, some of the, the muscles to strengthen around the hip and to get them um, to sit nicely in the socket. And then I also think about feet positioning with it. So we want the feet not to be rolling in. If you sublux a hip, generally speaking, it's always that internal rotation where they sublux in. So again, hyperextension of knees will pull the femurs in and make you more prone to subluxations. Um, you obviously are catching a nerve somewhere. So again, um, I think the first thing to do, I mean, inflammation have, they may, um, you may have a bit of a bursitis or something like that with the inflammation, which might be causing a bit pressure, a bit of pressure in the hip. Um, and the pain down the leg. Um, I, you say that you've had um, x-ray and MRI, so I'm assuming they've ruled out things like a labral tear. I think so. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't really know. I did actually also have um, a med serena done, but I don't know if they went down as far as the hip, to be honest. I think they kind of focus more on the spine and the the upper body. Um, okay. So I mean, I don't even know if they went down that far to look at it. So, but the the x I know the X ray and the the MRI that they did <clears throat> in the hospital. They just said, "Oh yeah, you're fine." So what I would say is probably now you can get referrals that feel like they're hip issues from the spine. So that may be what they're um, indicating. Uh, it it generally depends where the the pain is if it's like coming down the buttock side, that could be your sciatic nerve creating the pain and that can come into the area that feels like the hip. So it's quite common to get spine referrals down into, into the leg. It's interesting that you found sea swimming helpful. Um, what kind of stroke were you doing? Was it? I was, I was just, I was just going in and basically just kind of, um, Pat, you know, going into sort of shoulder depth and then just kind of treading water where I was. Okay, so you got that like external rotation then of the hips. And yeah, that, so I wasn't yeah. doing anything too crazy with my spine. It was just kind of treading right. water in and out, in and out. And it was just, I would do that sometimes for like an hour or two hours a day up until the beginning of October. And then I couldn't do it anymore with the weather. Um, right. Yeah. So, so with your, um, They've, they've suggested it might be spine related. Did they um, give you a diagnosis of anything in your spine? Yeah, they said there was a little bit of um, foraminal narrowing, but okay. nothing major. Okay. Um, 
They said there's a few bulging discs, but nothing major. There's a little bit of osteoarthritis in <clears throat> the lumbar and the um, upper area as well. Um, so there seemed to be like lots of little bits and pieces going on, but they're like, yeah, it's no big deal. Um, so what I would say, if your spine is referring into your leg, it will be one of those, not all of them together. Um, and it will be, uh, is there a movement direction? Like if you bend forward or if you arch your back, do you find you get more symptoms in the leg and hip? Yeah, if I were to bend backwards, that sounds okay. Helpful. So that will be the, the narrowing of the foramen. That will be your major um, issue then. So that will be what we would consider a more of an extension related issue. So again, you know, looking at your um, knees, a lot of times when people hyperextend their knees, they their pelvis arches, tries to center over the hip joints by going into a big arch in the lower back. So like your perfect exercise will be lying on your back, tying your band together or your knees together with a band, pushing your knees open as you tip back and flatten your back. That'll be a really nice exercise, both for your hip and your back. So you can okay. have, you could have a go with that. Yeah. Sort of like an oyster, but kind of lying on my back rather than my side. Yeah. And it's, it, it, I never give the oyster. It's a much, much better exercise with the band and both knees open. And then you've got the feedback from the band. So you've got the resistance. You're much less likely to go into the wrong muscles doing that. But that motion of the knees going open also anatomically goes with the flattening of the back. So if you do that on your back and you go into a pelvic tilt, it's, it, the system will be happier than if you try and lie on your side and lift a leg up. It's okay. a better, it's a I better pop, option. My leg pops a lot when I do oyster anyway. So it's yeah, so I'm not, yeah, it's not my favorite exercise. So try the lying on your back with the knees, with the band, make sure that your feet aren't rolling in. So think about a little bit more weight through, you know, the heel more laterally and, and hopefully that will be helpful. Let me know. Right. Thank you so much. That's all right. So um, question here, if the bottom rib keeps slipping, can we just get them surgically removed? Yes, the answer is yes, you can. Um, if it's only one rib, that's probably quite successful as, a, as an outcome, if you've tried everything else. So we've given you different options um, that I talked about on this presentation, which you'll have access to again. So I would exhaust all the other option, options before you go down the surgical route, but yes, they do do surgery on it. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. So breathing, um, yeah, so the last thing you wanna do is breathe because it's really painful when you breathe. It's a very big catch 22. So I know that they, they talk about doing breathing for it, but for me, I would say um, like an initial assessment um, to find out, we all have rotations in our body. Everybody does. And like the less we can rotate, like have something causing a rotation, the better all of it is. So it could be that maybe you're somebody who subluxures your shoulder a lot and then the shoulder sits there, that rotates you in one direction, or it might be a hip or it might be a foot or it might be your pelvis. So really trying to identify the thing that maybe creates more of the rotation in your body um, would be beneficial more than just trying to breathe it out. Because if you're breathing and you're in that torsion, you, you still have that compression where you don't want it and, and things aren't gonna work so well. So breathing is a fabulous exercise if your ribs are the cause of the problem if they are actually the cause of the problem. But if they aren't, you might just make it worse by doing breathing exercises. So what I would say is have an assessment and then see what the cause of the rotation is that will predispose the, the rib subluxation and then, um, and then go from there. Often the rib issues come with the side that's like what we would call inflection going forward. So a lot of um, relief comes from taking the ribs back into extension 
with slipping ribs or with subluxations in the back. They tend to have more problems going into flexion. Um, so maybe just lying over a, a not too big a towel or something. Um, if the pressure is not too painful, just to kind of go into a little bit of extension. Again, thinking about the shoulders, is one shoulder more forward, trying to just open that shoulder. Those sorts of things might help with them, with the ribs as well. Um, hopefully that's answered the question. Why does it happen when doing nothing? Um, because you're hypermobile and really unstable. So, so you're breathing, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it can be lying down. It can be sitting. Maybe you start to shift onto an elbow. So you're opening up one side of the ribs and closing the other, and you tend to go into a rotation. Um, but also, again, we, you, when I showed you that presentation, you could see the muscles in the back and how they all attach to the individual ribs. So maybe you sit, you know, on one bum cheek that even that's going to pull into the ribs. So we have to be really aware of, of what we do in terms of symmetry. It all affects the ribs. Um, so, or maybe you need to do some stabilizing exercises, um, so again, a good, uh, with everybody with these issues, I would say a good assessment is worth its weight in gold um, because there isn't one thing for everybody. Everybody's really individual. So there's no protocols, no magic exercises that I can give everybody. Um, so Jane has had to go and that's fine. So that's all the questions that I have on the chat. Um, does anybody else who's who's actually here live have any questions they'd like to ask? I do. Okay, Liz. Let's Hello. have a question. Well, that's been a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Okay. I've really um I'm sorry I came late to it. We've been out. Um yeah, so uh when I was 14, um I could stand on platform shoes and put my palms flat on the floor with straight knees. So I think I'm pretty unequivocally uh, hypermobile. My daughter's been uh, diagnosed as well. Um, and I have had problems with spondylosis since I was about 18 years old. Okay. But um, in recent years, I've been doing a lot of work on the back extension at the gym and also popping a pillow between my knees when I go to sleep. And it's made it dramatically better actually to the point I've almost forgotten I ever had that issue well I've got recently I think the last three or four months this shoulder um is just really giving me a lot of jib and I think you know with lockdown and everything you know and, and the situation with the GP surgeries being as they are there's just no yeah. way I'm going to go and ask yeah. them about it I don't think but like the other day um I was picking up one of the bird feeders to um you know, clean it and refresh it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you know, I really Not shouldn't right. really like that doing that. Uh-huh. And um, sometimes if I sleep on that side, it just, you know, it's not comfortable. Do you feel like it's unstable? Or do you feel like it's impinging something? Does it feel more pinchy? Like, do you feel blocked? I don't, really, I, do you know what? I can't even work out exactly where it's hurting, which sounds pretty okay. stupid. But That's for the last, as I say, three or four months now, I, I keep doing this and thinking, well, where is the site of the pain actually coming from? And I haven't really even bottomed it out yet, which sounds really crazy. OK, is the pain there all the time or is it movement based? So is it when you lift your arm more? Um, I don't notice it all the time. Okay. So you knew when you tried to reach up that it wasn't right. Yeah, that that really because my, my, my daughter and my husband are both taller than me and Normally they do the bird feeders, but my husband was away working in Sheffield and um, I, I did it. And it was just an inch or two taller than I was comfortable right. with. And I just had to stretch that little bit more. And I was like, wow, you know, okay. I maybe should have got like a little stool to stand on or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll give you, I'll, I'll recommend something that you could try. We will do a talk on shoulders because shoulders are, are slightly more complicated. Um, because your shoulder involves your collarbone and your shoulder blade. It's all mm -hmm. part of the same complex. So mm -hmm. your actual shoulder blade in back 
is the socket for your arm. And people don't actually like realize that. I remember when I first learned anatomy because I had dislocating shoulders and it was a real light bulb moment for me that actually my shoulder blade was the socket for my shoulder. So like if it doesn't move and I move my arm, I'm going to sublux. So your shoulder blade always needs to be making certain movements with your arm. Mm -hmm. So one of the things um, I do a lot with my clients is I get a really light, stretchy band, um, you know, the, the physiotherapy bands, and I take it behind the ribs. Um, I don't have a band here to show you, but oh, even a, a scarf, I take it all the way behind the ribs. Now your shoulders are very much linked to your hands. So your um, the shoulders are there to help you do stuff with your hands. So when I do my rehabilitation with shoulders, I use I usually hold something like a band or I have a fist. And then I want you, so if you're gonna like have a little go and you could, yeah, if you have a stretchy band, a lot of us do. I have a selection like, of them, yes. As I say, you know, we've all been to physiotherapy and we've all done stuff. So most of us have stretchy bands now. Yeah. When you start, you can start with just taking your arms forward. We have two options when we move our arms. We can move it from the front of our body, or we can think about our shoulder blade or back, and we can feel like our shoulder blade and back takes our arm forward. And the same with going up, our shoulder blade can take our arm up, or we can kind of take it, but we're separating our arm from the shoulder blade. And a lot of times um, what we do because we're unstable and we have got a lot of ligament laxity is we tend to move the arm without moving the, the rest of the bones that need to go with it. So have a go just lying on your back or in a chair for feedback. So you can feel that your, your upper back, if that part of your spine is there and then feel like just start forward, not up. Try and take the band and think, I'm going to take the band for my shoulder blades. So the band will give your shoulder blades a bit of proprioception and then come back. And if that's comfortable, then maybe try to go a little bit higher up and then gradually try and take it higher up. Don't go just straight up that way. Start with bent arms. So have a lower lever and see how that feels. Because um, sometimes it's just retraining the brain that your shoulder blade needs to move with your arm. And it sounds like you got to a certain point and then you kept reaching. So you may have just yeah. reached that arm out of yeah. the socket a bit. Yeah. And when you reach, the shoulder blade has to reach mm -hmm. to take the arm. So have a go with that and see how that goes. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. That's oh, all well. right. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Nope, I think, I think that's it. We've covered the questions for today. So um, it was really lovely chatting with you all and really lovely to be invited to talk to this group because I haven't done it before. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll have, we will cover the pelvis and the shoulder a little bit more with a presentation coming up in the future. So thank you for tuning in, the people who did. Um, this will be recorded now, which is really lovely. So we will, um, I'm sure Jane will have that put on the, the SEDS private group as well. So have a lovely rest of your weekend and I'll look forward to seeing you all on another, another little talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bonnie. Enjoy your weekend as well. You're very welcome. So I'll say goodbye to everyone. Bye-bye.